All right. I think we can go ahead and get started. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, today, for joining the Duke Initiative for Science and Society for the next installment of our coronavirus conversations. My name is Andrew Parasak, and I am a research analyst um, at, here at Science and Society, and I'll be moderating today's event, which is looking at the changes to hurricane response that may be necessary to minimize the risk of spreading COVID-19, um, especially uh, given that forecasts for hurricanes here have predicted a particularly active Atlantic hurricane season. If response to COVID-19 was a perfect storm of challenging factors, then adding on a broad scale natural disaster will only magnify those effects, perfect storms. So in addition to holding this event, of which the video recording will be on our YouTube channel in a few days, our staff here at Science and Society have collected best practice debrief that was just published a few minutes ago. You can access that brief for free on our SciPol.org website, that's S-C-I-P-O-L.org. But to further explore this issue, we've brought together today a terrific group of scholars to share their thoughts and ideas, and I will introduce them shortly. Do so. If you have any questions for our panelists, you can send those to Ben Shepard using the chat function at the bottom of the screen, and he'll, he will redirect those questions to me, and I'll try to get to as many of the audience questions as possible. Um, please, throughout the event, make sure to keep your video off and your microphone muted. Again, if you do have questions, just use that chat function to Ben Shepard. After the event, I invite you to visit the Science and Society website, which is scienceandsociety.duke.edu, to learn about our next coronavirus conversation will return to work policies as we continue to see COVID case numbers rise. That event will take place on Thursday, July 9th at 2.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And while you're on the Duke Science and Society, you can learn about our master's degree program, where our students and faculty address all these different issues we've been talking about um, in these coronavirus conversations on a daily basis. So with that all out of the way, I'll go ahead and introduce our panelists. Dr. Mark Apkowitz is a professor of civil and environmental engineering, professor of engineering management, and the director of the Vanderbilt Center for Environmental Management Studies at Vanderbilt University School of Engineering. His research focuses on enterprise risk management, hazardous materials, transportation, safety, and security, assessing the impacts of extreme weather on infrastructure adaptation, and spatial analysis of freight transportation systems. Dr. Apkowitz, author of Operational Risk Management, a case study approach to effective planning and response, he has served as a member of the Nuclear Waste Technical Review Board, appointed to this position by President George W. Bush in Ju June 2002. And he is the recipient of the Distinguished Service Award from the National Academy of Sciences for his leadership role with the Transportation Research Board. Next, we have Dr. Elizabeth A. Albright, who is an assistant professor of the practice at Duke University's Nichols School of the Environment. And she engages in research around questions of local level resilience and community learning in response to extreme events. Elizabeth is currently working on projects studying response to disasters in various regions across the United States. Funded by the National Science Foundation, her work in Colorado was awarded the Paul A. Sabatier Award for Best Paper in Environmental Politics at the American Political Science Association's annual meeting. She has published on response to perceptions of climate change, the advocacy coalition framework, and stakeholder participation in state level regulatory processes. And for full disclosure, Dr. Albright was one of my favorite professors when I was a master's student at Duke's Nicholas School. So especially glad that she could join today. And Lauren Sauer is an assistant professor of emergency medicine at the Johns Hopkins University School of Medicine and the director of operations with the Johns Hopkins Office of Critical Event Preparedness and Response. She's also a, re she's also a research associate in the Department of Emergency Medicine and a doctoral candidate in health and public policy in the Johns Hopkins Department of Health Policy and Management where she studies quality of aid in response to, to disasters and the effects of disasters on healthcare infrastructure. Sauer is also the program manager for the National Center for the Study of Preparedness and Catastrophic Event Response, PACER, a Department of Homeland Security Emeritus. She's worked remotely and on the ground for several disaster responses, including Hurricane Katrina, the 2009 California wildfires, the Haiti earthquake, the Pakistan floods, and more recently, the Ebola virus disease outbreak in West Africa. So I'm very excited to have all three of these panels here today and look forward to hearing their expertise about both the scientific understanding of hurricanes and COVID, as well as what policy suggestions they may have to address these coinciding perfect storms. So to start the conversation, I'm gonna give each panelist about five minutes for any opening remarks they have. Um, and Lauren, let's go ahead and start with you if you are ready. Yeah, thanks for having me. Um, you know, as we move into a world that's increasingly impacted by climate change and globalization, 
We also see significant decreases in funding at the same time to public health infrastructure. Our global and national public health workforce remains significantly overtaxed and underfunded. Our global, <laughs> excuse me, this is the time of year that that public health workforce, those who are currently responding to COVID, would normally be deep in the throes of hurricane prepared activities in the health system. And we don't have a deep bench to pull from to support this expanded need. Not only does COVID require resources in and of itself and take away from those resources from responses, it also requires an adaptation to literally all of our healthcare and public health response planning activities for hurricane season. We know that supply chains are already disrupted. Shelter operations will require significant overhauls and possibly conflicting methods of evacuation must be carefully delivered to thread a needle of the need to safely leave an area while keeping those critical physical distancing practices in place. So we're at a point where we need to reflect on our ability to maintain a level of response that supports the well-being of affected communities, both for COVID and in hurricane season. We need to think about the general public more broadly. And also important is our responder workforce across the globe. We have to think about the resources that we have prioritized for healthcare and public health. And this hurricane season, unfortunately, will give us um, the lens to do just that. So as we move into hurricane season, um, the idea that we structure our, we are still applying our resources to COVID while also ensuring that we can make as much use of that COVID response activity to prepare for the hurricane response as well is absolutely critical. I'll end it there and hand it over to the next panelist. Thanks. Great, thank you so much. Um, Betsy, uh, you can go. Sure. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you for the introduction and kind words. So as Andrew said, I'm an environmental social scientist and policy scholar at, at Duke, and I study disasters and long-term disaster recovery, including flooding and hurricanes. So for example, after Hurricane Florence, which hit the coastal plain, a couple of years ago, three of my students, and I'll give a shout out, uh, Rachel Gozenhauser, Kyle Cornish, Alicia Zhao, I encourage you to look at their report online. So in collaboration with a local organization, they interviewed 26 individuals and organizations on the coastal plain of North Carolina asking about, about questions of um, so really that's where my research centers in, at community level and focused on long-term recovery. And I'm also uh, most recently a part of a multi-institutional team that has received a National Science Foundation grant to study policies and public perceptions and behavior change uh, related to COVID-19. And we're conducting surveys and analyzing COVID-related state and local policies. So just a couple of points I'd like to make first off. One, uh, many communities along the Atlantic coast broadly and more specifically in the Southeast, Gulf Coast, Puerto Rico are still recovering from past hurricanes whether from Hurricanes Matthew, Florence, Dorian, Hiratna, Irma, Maria in Puerto Rico, Harvey in Texas, and I could go on and on here. And recovery from hurricanes has been slow and policy response inadequate. As an example, in North Carolina, it took 500 days between Hurricane Florence and the distribution of federal housing and funds, over 500 days. So also our work has shown that administrative capacities of local communities is limited. And so it's not just the upcoming hurricane season that worries me, it's hurricanes of the past, worsened by layers of inadequate recovery and policy failures. So we have a system of compounding and cascading risks to think about and address. Which gets me to my second point, when thinking about hurricanes and COVID-19, both individually and together, we need to think about issues of disproportionate impact. We know that low wealth communities and communities of color are disproportionately affected by COVID-19, both in health and economic impacts. This is also often the case with hurricanes, and especially in the American South, but elsewhere as well, the impacts of hurricanes are amplified disproportionately across race due to centuries of institutional and systemic racism. Further studies have documented inequitable access to resources for hurricane recovery across race. So all this taken together, the risks of hurricanes will magnify risks of COVID and vice versa. 
with more significant impacts on communities of color, under-resourced communities, and people who are living or working in congregate facilities, nursing homes, correctional facilities, meat, packing, meat processing facilities, et cetera. So in short, we, we need to figure out better policies and practices, federal, state, and local to empower and get needed resources to local communities, families, individuals, communities who are marginalized, communities who have limited access to resources. And we need to think about risks and recovery broadly. Recovery is more than just rebuilding homes after a hurricane or recovering from COVID, but it's strengthening and empowering communities addressing issues of failure and inadequate infrastructure, access to healthcare, jobs, healthy foods, education, the internet, and it's addressing other environmental risks. And my third point, and I'll start making these points shorter, um, research has shown that social capital, relationships, ties that bind neighborhoods, communities, families together matter. And they matter a lot in disasters. Maintaining these ties when we are physically distancing becomes even more, more important. Governments need to support and empower community on the ground organizations to strengthen their tools to engage with community members now and during and after a hurricane in the context of COVID-19. Organizations that have the trust of community members and long-term relationships. Empower organizations to disseminate information, masks, PPE, guidance on where to shelter and how, et cetera. And then my final point, and then I'll it's for a bit. Um, we are stuck in a process of reactive decision making. This is true for COVID just as it is true for hurricanes. Preparedness is rarely if ever discussed outside the disaster window. There are incentives for policymakers to invest in pre-disaster preparedness, but we know that um, pre-disaster planning, preparedness, and risk mitigation saves lives and has a great return on investment, but we fail time and again. So just to wrap up, four themes, compounding risks in past disasters, disproportionate impacts across race and wealth, social capital and empower the local, and pre-disaster planning and preparedness. So thank you, and I look forward to engaging in the panel today. Great. Thank you so much, Bessie. Um, and then Mark, you're up. Okay. Thanks, Andrew. First of all, I very much appreciate the opportunity, and um, uh, commend Duke for uh, hosting uh, these types of events because I think they are uh, very important in terms of sharing ideas across a broad spectrum of uh, folks who are involved in, in different disciplines and in different communities. Uh, I've been involved in enterprise risk management uh, for probably the last couple of decades and I've done a fair amount of work both in the public and the private sector. So I feel I have a pretty healthy lens on on the different ways that people are uh, witnessing and uh, experiencing uh, these kinds of events. One of the ideas that I want to introduce uh, broadly in this discussion is something that uh, we emphasize a lot in our work, which is a, a very much an interdisciplinary approach. And I, I refer to that as the social technical nexus. And the point of the matter is, is that uh, whether you're involved in risk management, risk assessment, or risk communication, which are all part of, of an enterprise approach, uh, we have to understand not just uh, the kinds of solutions that might be, um, we might be able to, to uh, apply to a situation, but we have to understand the political and social environment that um, we're, we're trying to solve that problem within. And, in many respects, it, we get the tail in front of the, the, the wagging the dog, and that we, we try to come up with these solutions when the solution space is truly defined by the political and social landscape. And, and as a result, uh, many of us, but especially even in academia, uh, sometimes get caught in our ivory towers and we create these solutions in search of a problem, which is not a particularly healthy way to do things. Um, and I also want to point out that even though hurricanes is the topic du jour, uh, really any extreme weather event or natural disaster, and you could even extend that to significant man-made events, uh, is going to put many of the same uh, pressures on the system. Um, and so this is, uh, there's no area in the country that's immune from the conversation we're having today. We may need to substitute a hurricane for wildfire or earthquake or flood or tornado, uh, but the context really pretty much remains the, the same. Uh, but with regard to hurricanes, uh, we may get into this conversation later, but 
uh, the National Oceanographic and Atmospheric Administration is already predicting a, a stronger than average uh, season, which uh, will run, uh, well, is running now through November. Uh, so we really have a, a ways to go here and we're fortunate that nothing's happened yet. Uh, but what we are seeing as a general trend is that we have rising sea levels and higher storm surge coming from these more frequent and severe events. And so it's, it's kind of a devastating one-two punch at the same time that demographically we're seeing uh, more investment in uh, coastal communities. So even if you put coronavirus aside, uh, we're dealing with a growing problem from just managing the risk gains. Now, when you superimpose coronavirus on there, uh, it really presents uh, two problems. One, which my colleagues have already made reference to, is the, um, you know, the risks that uh, are imposed by having to manage traditional emergency response practices that really become a greater threat because of COVID. And the second thing, which was also brought up by uh, my, my colleagues, is the competition for limited resources. Um, so, so those are both very much prominent in, in the, the conversation. The other thing that I would point out is the time dimension. Um, my sense is that we're going to experience much longer periods of recovery as well. And so this is not necessarily as much of an episodic event as it is a combination of an episodic and chronic event. Great, well, thank you all so much. Um, so a lot of really uh, great ideas, insightful ideas there. And what I try to do now for the next few minutes is unpack some of those a little bit, get into a little more details um, to, you know, really see, you know, what the situation is right now as we look at this hurricane COVID overlap. And then, you know, again, think about maybe what uh, some of those reasonable policy solutions could be, whether that's policy coming from the government or whether that's policies that individual hospitals, shelters, things like that might be implementing. Um, so. So Mark, to stay with you for a little bit, um, yeah, you were mentioning some of those hurricane forecasts, which as was pretty widely publicized, have seemed a little more severe this year than they have in the past. Could you spend just a kind of a, you know, relatively short uh, additional explanation about, you know, exactly what those forecasts say and maybe what don't they say? Like, for instance, do we know uh, how many of those storms are going to be severe? Or do we know how many are going to hit land? Um, what, what can we glean from those forecasts? So NOAA um, has a climate prediction center, which is where they develop these forecasts for the, um, the coming hurricane season. And um, it's, it's, you know, they can't predict these things with certainty, but that they do is they establish a level of confidence around their estimates. And for this coming year, their level of confidence is at 70%, which, you know, some people will say, well, what about the other 30%? You don't know what's going to happen. And my attitude is, well, let's think about the 70%. That's a, a reasonably high degree of confidence more than, you know, that, that these are things that, that are, are more likely to happen. And what they are saying is that um, there's a 60% chance of an above normal season and only a 10% chance of a below normal season. And they go one step further to point out that uh, normally they, uh, on an average basis, you would probably experience um, about uh, six hurricanes and three of them will be major. Um, this year, they are saying that um, uh, they are expecting, uh, I think, six to ten hurricanes, of which um, three to six will be major. So that kind of gives you a context of, of what we might um, expect, you know, relative to um, years past. Great. And, and correct me if I'm wrong, but major in this sense means at least category three or higher, which is 111 miles an hour winds, I think? That's correct. Thank you for, for that. Uh, those are generally considered the ones that are associated with winds that can be very different in terms of their damage consequences. Yes. Okay. So, yeah. So, bad season. Luckily, again, nothing has hit yet. Um, and yeah, I mean, I guess, and even Mark, or if anyone else wants to chime in on this, um, you know, one of the things I think as someone who grew up uh, in Virginia that I'm used to seeing is, you know, all the, uh, both the evacuations and the shelters that start taking place when there is a prediction of a landfalling hurricane. Um, so, you know, how, how strong do these hurricanes have to be typically for those sort of measures to occur? I know we had a few tropical storms, you know, uh, uh, hit a little bit of some coastal area this year. 
Um, but do we typically see evacuations or shelters for smaller storms? Or is it really going to be those major storms? Um, well, I, I was waiting for someone else to say something, but let me just quickly say that um, the, the amount of damage is, is always, it's a function, first of all, of the location of the hurricane. And um, not just how, you know, in one, under what form it takes landfall, but also what side of the, of the, the cyclone, if you will, you fall on. Um, and, and, but, but a lot of it also has to do with the, uh, the vulnerability that an, an area has uh, to these events, you know, depending upon the structural conditions that, um, you know, that buildings infrastructure are in, uh, what kinds of um, uh, above, what men's things may be in place to keep storm surge from, from, you know, being much more aggressive. But what I do also want to say is, that to my way of thinking, the, the hurricane season concept also applies to, to tropical storms because some of the, the so much energy that spawns these hurricanes sometimes they may not get to the level of, of being considered classified as a hurricane but a lot of people will argue especially more inland that tropical storms are actually more dangerous than hurricanes because they can tend to stall and and, and put 15 to 20 inches of rain on you in a very small period of time and we've seen in places like Houston that the inland flooding was a much more severe consequence than the hurricane itself. Yeah, and I would just add to that that it's it's not just a sort of like what you were saying. It's it's not just this this product of the wind speed, which is driving the category. But um, if conditions are make the area vulnerable to flooding, if um, communities have a hard time evacuating uh, quickly. These can all factor into decisions to make that that either voluntary or mandatory evacuation order, and all of those decisions have to be made in careful context with where the evacuation order will move people to and how it will move people um, out of the area, and then when can they potentially go back in? Sorry, yeah, I'm, Betsy, I didn't mean to cut you off. Oh uh, no, 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 that's fine. Um, yeah, and I'm no um, climatologist, but I. I the series of hurricanes we've seen in North Carolina, I would say, have not been wind-driven events, but have been this sitting and excessive rainfall events um, that have caused the majority of problem. I just got back from Ocracoke Island, which was devastated, and Hurricane Dorian, which was, in effect, a kind of seven-foot storm surge from the um, from the sound that washed over. So I think we need to think more broadly about um, about hurricanes beyond you know, beyond the category one, two, three, four, five. Yeah, and no, I think that's uh, makes a lot of sense. And yeah, again, even as someone who yeah, grew up inland in, in Virginia, yeah, I, I know for, for me, when the hurricane hit, it was like, yeah, the flooding was more the concern, um, less so than the wind. So definitely, um, definitely makes sense. Um, Lauren, to go back to you, um, to think now about, you know, when there is gonna be some of this sheltering or evacuation, again, the, you know, the, the news media loves to show it, images of overflowing shelters that, you know, tons of cots put next to each other, you know, images that this year really frightened me given what we know about how COVID might spread among individuals. Um, so can you go into a little about, you know, maybe what some of that um, understanding is of, that we know right now about really any disease spread, but particularly COVID, um, and what that might mean for things like shelters, um, for hospitals, nursing homes, places like that with a lot of vulnerable people who are in close proximity to one another? Yeah, I think a lot of the congregate setting work that's been done by a lot of the aid organizations and by the CDC and by the WHO can be applied when you're thinking about shelter operations. Um, and I know uh, the Red Cross is actively working on, on how they'll approach this as they are one of the major shelter providers um, in natural disasters. Um, you know, when you look at some of these uh, short-term congregate examples like the comfort or like some of the large-scale um, hospital uh, you know acute care facilities that have been set up these hospitals field hospitals for lack of a better term um, one of the things that i think was tried to do early was to make non-covid hospitals um, but given the challenges with testing um, particularly testing with very short turnaround uh, we we see you know, practical challenges to that. And that's something to be taken into consideration, testing on entry of, of challenge and potentially sets you up for a risk. Uh, 
um, population. We also know that people who enter into shelters rather than shel you know, evacuating and sheltering with family members or loved ones or temporary housing like hotels, um, oftentimes are a more vulnerable and more medically susceptible population. And so that's gonna present an even bigger challenge for our workforce, um, how you manage these people. Shelters aren't always set up to provide basic med more, than, more than basic medical care. And a lot of the people who staff our shelters, particularly those healthcare providers who support, the nurses in particular, who support shelter operations, um, are already deployed to other activities for COVID response. So purely um, the numbers game of staffing, a potential regional response to a hurricane or any other weather event um, that we see coming in the next few months here, um, is going to be a huge challenge. And we have to start thinking about it now. And we have to support the, the groups that think about it regularly because they're also thinking about COVID response now and they've been pulled into COVID response. So we have to give them the structure to um, expand their own workforce. Yeah, what happened maybe some of the um, the more concrete things that even some of those other organizations, whether it's CDC or FEMA or state uh, emergency management organizations, what are some of the more concrete things they're thinking about doing that might be different this year compared to previous years? Um, well, one of them is this like concept of open words is sort of going away or open, you know, spacing for the cot, you know, the mass cots, the, the ones you're sort of talking about that you see in, in these visual images over and over again, particularly out of Katrina and, and large storms like that. Um, putting up physical barriers, changing HVAC systems, um, possible outdoor shelters and spaces that aren't affected by weather. All of these things are practical approaches that are different from the way we traditionally think. Oftentimes we're thinking of sheltering um, efficiencies, less space, less privacy, less, you know, of your own air. And and that becomes really hard to, to maintain in a, a sort of COVID world. Um, what the hygiene looks like, what the water and sanitation looks like, how we will manage testing of the patients, I think remains to be seen for a lot of these sites. I think there's a, like, like I was saying earlier, the way we're approaching things like nursing homes, where you go and you do community testing, you do education, retraining of the staff on basic hygiene principles. Um, we've dealt with other infectious diseases in shelter settings before. And I think there's a lot of practical lessons to be learned um, from that. You know, this is a very, very susceptible population. So keeping that in mind is really important. I'd like to just add that I think uh, the logistic of this whole process is um, challenging because uh, we, we, we will have probably fewer resources available at the same time we may have more people um, coming into a shelter or evacuation situation. And so consequently, you really have to think through um, the throughput process while maintaining a level of health standard that doesn't put more people at risk. So um, let's say a bunch of people show up at a gymnasium and you know, how, how, how are you going to process them? I mean, people, that, that one way is to obviously take their temperature, but you may have asymptomatic people at that point in time and, and so there's no guarantee that you're going to be able to siphon off the people that are ill or known to be ill to somewhere else. Um, how do we feed these people? Uh, traditionally or oftentimes there have been buffet lines to feed these folks. Well, now we have to think about individual meals and, and that kind of thing. So it's, um, there are some very practical logistical questions and um, I would like to advocate for uh, emergency response agencies developing a new playbook uh, mm -hmm. and, 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 and maybe training exercises, simulations, so that this doesn't become, uh, you know, as uh, Betsy was mentioned, it doesn't become another reactive uh, response, but you know, actually anticipating that this will happen as opposed to being surprised when it does. I mean, we know COVID is going to be with us for a while. We know natural disasters are going to happen. And because COVID is affecting everyone, it, it, by definition, the natural disaster, wherever it does happen, is going to happen in a COVID environment. Yeah, uh, big, uh, for sure, big logistics kind of a problem that we seem to be, uh, you know, getting into here, which is um, 
glad for those people that are making those plans for sure. Um, so one thing I guess related along these lines, um, and maybe Lauren, Betsy, maybe one of you can address this. Um, the, even started to see that you know as people are concerned about contracting COVID-19, that even if local uh, emergency managers are saying we need to evacuate, you need to get to shelters, there may be people who just outright don't do that this year because of that fear of, of contracting mm -hmm. the disease. Um, so what sort of communication might be necessary to affected communities, especially the lower income communities, the communities of color, who, what sort of communication for those communities uh, to make sure that they do take uh, heed of these warnings if a hurricane is approaching? What I've um, been thinking about, one, is, is using networks, using are working with collaboratively community organizations that are already on the ground that are already have trust with community members and work with them, whether they're um, faith-based organizations, community-based culture, um, you know, organizations that are already established working and serving the Latinx community um, and working, um, the local governments, the state governments, working with a network of organizations who then can be an inter intermediary between the government and um, community members. And so there is a lot of trust and comfort. I also think it's critical. I mean, I was doing a scan of, and I've, I've been working with students to help download kind of local policies across the U.S. And some states and local governments are doing really well at putting out information in multiple languages, and some aren't at all. And one, it's one thing to have information on a website, but not everyone has access to the internet. And so information needs to be disseminated to where community members are and not expecting community members to go to the local government. And so thinking creatively about communication, messaging, what type of messaging um, will work in a COVID and hurricane context and working with um, community-based organizations on the ground. Yeah, I agree. I think I think we're in a trust vacuum um, a little bit, especially with our um, public our public health authorities and local uh, public health authorities have really taken up the the role of the trusted messenger in some places and very much not in others. And um, one of the things we learned the hard way, and to Betsy's earlier point about this um, lack of preparedness, you know. Um, and always having to be reactive is that we've learned the, the lesson over and over again. Sometimes in order to garner trust, the message has to be for local and very specific to which or address. And the community themselves have to be involved in the building of the message. And mm -hmm. I think that is something that, that we have gotten better at globally. And I think what we're seeing in the US is that um, we're not so great at that actually here in the US. And we this is the time to get better at it because if not, none of this will work actually. <laughs> yeah, I completely agree. Yeah. Well, go ahead. Go ahead, Betsy. No, no, I was just going to say I, I second what, what Lauren says. So, okay, I, think, all yeah, you. I, I third that. But um, <laughs> uh, what, what I also wanted to point out in, in our audience in general with risk communication, um, you have a real window of opportunity if you can put some of these um, foundational elements in place before the disaster actually strikes. Mm. Because people then have an opportunity to, to learn, absorb, um, act upon it, um, and by the time that the disaster happens and these and the messaging begins, it's no longer a uh, you know uh, an immediate uh, you know an anxious and stressful way of of reacting because you already sort of tuned into the idea that um, everything that you heard about when you had the ability to absorb it is now coming to fruition, and and, and it's it's not uh, you know the the first time you've been exposed. Uh, it, to, to the whole, um, you know, way of thinking. And I, I think um, more work needs to be done. And it's one thing that our, I think I mentioned it, the NSF rapid response um, grant we got, it's a part of this risk and social policy group I'm working with is we're looking at people's, we ask them a broad open-ended question about what messages do you remember? What messages do we, um, do you recall when you think about COVID? And I think we need to really think about and I know lots of work has been in this risk communication, but in this 
particular context, I think we, we, there's a space to, from an academic lens, figure out what's effective. The other thing I would add very quickly is that um, some people talk about messaging to the um, audience, and I think about it as messaging to the audiences. Mm -hmm. Many different people out there that absorb information in different ways, different languages, uh, different perceptions. And so we really have to understand the demographics of the area and make sure that we're reaching each of those uh, audiences in a way that um, they can actually absorb and, and, and understand. The onus is, should not be placed on those audiences to try to translate yes. whatever it is we're trying to do. Yes. Yeah, thank you all for that. And since, since we're on the kind of the topic of communicating to public's uh, communities, audiences, um, one of the questions we actually got from a lot of uh, the audience members who are SVP is, is a little bit more a broader science communication question, um, kind of what people can do as individuals to prepare for hurricane season, especially um, you know, if they do live on the coast or even if they do live inland, which could be uh, susceptible to flooding. Are there any particular things that individuals should be doing this year? Should state or local governments be helping out with some of that uh, communication, especially given that, as we were just been saying, that certain communities may have higher levels of, levels of distrust of government? What kind of could those broader uh, messaging networks be? I think one of the things that we can all do actually that will help with prepare, hurricane preparedness and our hurricane response is to take to heart the messages around the non-pharmaceutical interventions that will improve our COVID response. Um, and if, because if we can drive down some of the levels, the high burdens of, of COVID that we have across the country, particularly in our vulnerable populations, we will be better off. We're still gonna to have to deal with COVID and hurricane season together, but the fewer cases that we have of COVID, the better we will be and the easier all of the additional measures that have to be in place will be for our, our public health and our health workforce. So the things like physical distancing, like limiting your time outside to either, you know, outside activities or essential trips to the store and things like that, um, wearing those face coverings, being, understanding that messaging around like my mask is for you your mask is for me and and that we're all out here trying to protect our community members and our vulnerable especially our vulnerable community members is critical um i think also the the idea that that people have plans for how they will evacuate if they need to and what their essential medications are you know those 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 simple activities that we reinforce with our preparedness messaging in hurricane season become all the more important during COVID times when the research, the resources are even more limited. I think an, an interesting exercise on the personal preparation level, if you had a disaster, you know, to go kit, what would you put in it if it was just a hurricane that you were responding to and how would that be different? a pandemic and you know so PPE and a variety of, of other things you might stockpile under these circumstances um, really change the, the, the nature of what an individual can do to be prepared. And I'd, I'd like to add on to that I completely agree with all that's been said and I'd add on as as we even others have found in disaster research that networks with friends with neighbors with other community members really matter so Chet, you know, even though we can't be within close proximity of each other, get, you know, get your neighbor's phone numbers, check in on them, figure out what a neighborhood plan is. I know our neighborhood, we've set up a mutual aid um, system where, you know, some folks have resources and can share food. Some folks are growing community gardens and sharing with others. And so thinking on a kind of an interdependence uh, more resilient, more local, building networks and building community ties. And I think that um, helps out as well in a socially distant um, PPE wearing way. Yeah, and those networks can really serve um, the communities and the individuals within those communities that will be most affected, right? So if mm -hmm. you have that network already built and you know that someone is not good with technology and won't be able uh -huh. to see alerts for evacuations or doesn't have a social network that's getting them groceries or able to get their three days of medication. All of those things will 
benefit the community as a whole, but also the individuals that are most at, at risk. So, and I think that's, um, again, all great. And brings up another interesting point, um, which, you know, we've been hearing a lot um, in relation to the entire COVID crisis has been um, access to PPE, especially for healthcare workers, for the people that aren't able to evacuate because they might be staying in hospitals or nursing homes or in these shelters to help care. Um, you know, even just, I think yesterday, I saw the American Medical Association uh, sent a letter to the vice president, to FEMA, saying that the federal government should be doing a better job with PPE coordination. It still sounds like, at least for those hospital, those clinical settings, it still seems like PPE is still relatively limited, even if we're getting better at wearing, uh, as a member of the public, wearing cloth masks. Um, so especially, you know, thinking about, again, the disruptions to supply chains if a hurricane, supply lines if a hurricane hits, um, and, and given that there might just be an influx of new patients, uh, what sort of planning can there be to make sure that there is adequate PPE for healthcare professionals or for first responders? Um, are, are, and perhaps another way of saying that is our local or state governments are already planning for natural disasters and, and in the need for PPE, or is that still really just focused on COVID right now? <laughs> well, I can start. Uh, supply chains are something that are um, near and dear to me. I would like to expand um, your question, Andrew, to, to go beyond just uh, supplying uh, the um, hospitals and healthcare professionals with what they need. It goes to being able to provide society with, with what they need um, because there's a number of other important things, toilet paper <laughs> included, that uh, we, you know, we're we all recognize, uh, you know, that's uh, being able to provide those resources companies that it, it comes from somewhere and it has to get to you. So the, the logistics, the supply chain are, are really a critical part of this overall process. And, um, and it's already stra uh, constrained by a number of factors. Uh, one is COVID related because we have the situation where truck drivers, who might normally distribute this stuff are sick. Um, people that are, are, are manufacturing these things are sick. Uh, people that would normally be on the ground, uh, uh, nonprofits and others are, are potentially sick. Uh, so a lot of that has to be or is being done remotely um, rather than boots on the ground. And then uh, when you add to that, one of the big problems we have is that most industries, because of the global economic tension, have not been maintaining much in the way of inventory because, and so we have this situation where to be economically competitive pre-COVID is diametrically opposed to being risk, um, you know, risk management oriented uh, in a, in a situation where we have COVID. So we're, we already have the supply chain is a problem getting resources to places. It's also a problem because we didn't have a, a buildup of, of inventory to even draw from under those um, circles, circumstances. The disappointing thing to me is that this could have been um, a great place for the federal government to, to make a difference. Uh, because, you know, in some ways, um, it's, it's their job to source these things from places where they know it exists and to distribute it to, to where it's most needed. And, and that particular failure. Um, is mystifying to some extent because there is um, in the military we have the Defense Logistics Agency and 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 they are really um, capable of doing these kinds of things. If you thought of the United COVID as sort of the theater of operations, um, they they would be uh, an excellent organization to be able to manage that. And um, the federal involvement in a leadership role, we're actually seeing communities try to take on that that job. There's, a, there's coalitions of communities in various places, not necessarily for hurricanes, but for floods and other things, where they're, they're basically combining their um, purchasing power to, to act as a backstop in the way of resources uh, and, and inventory uh, under the, the you know, proviso that they're going to have to fend for themselves if something happens. Yeah, and I would just add that um, one of the added challenges on the healthcare and public health side, um, especially when you think about the resources needed for COVID, like the flock swabs for testing, the um, glass vials, the 
IV bags that are needed to treat these patients for fluids, um, many of those are in very high risk hurricane prone environments like Puerto Rico. Um, and we saw a significant disruption in our ability to just manage flu immediately following the hurricanes from a few years ago. And so if you take that and amplify it with the already um, protracted supply chain crisis that we're experiencing right now, um, and put those places at risk again, um, when COVID may even hit, you know, when we're managing COVID during flu season, and that may come at the tail end of hurricane season, um, but that has the potential to be absolutely detrimental to our ability to manage not just any of these events, but all of them. So maybe as a one more kind of broader question here, and we're quickly approaching the end of our time, um, but I guess as a, as a sort of a broader question, and, and maybe Betsy, you want to start here. Um, I know you were mentioning, uh, you know, one of your concerns um, is just and I think, Lauren, you were even just uh, alluding to this as well, right, is that any hurricane that's going to hit will be bad, but there are these areas like Puerto Rico, so recovering from, from Hurricane Maria and the earthquakes it had, uh, portions of North Carolina's coast that are still um, recovering from some of the recent hurricanes that, that we've had there. Uh, so I guess the question there is, you know, like, what sort of... Uh, what sort of work is, is necessary to make sure that if a hurricane hits one of those areas again, hopefully not, but you know, are there, are there things that are happening now on the ground already in response in some of those areas? Are there additional things we need to be doing on top of getting ready for new hurricanes, on top of getting ready for potential COVID spread? Um, you know, that, that might be applicable this year. Yeah, and it's an excellent question and one, you know, that I, I think about a lot, both professionally and just, you know, broadly. Is, I think we need to get out of this disaster response, disaster response framework and really think how do we build and empower local communities, um, whether it's COVID risk, whether it's hurricane risk, how, what do communities, how do they envision there and whether these are communities covering from a hurricane or neighboring communities that maybe were less touched, you know, what future do they envision economically, um, across a broad range of, of sectors, education, health, right? One of the things I'm, I'm worried about with, you know, is education and COVID and hurricanes and access to infrastructure and the redundancies of our systems and who will be able to, if we need to, um, you know, attend school from home and who won't. And, and these are just, these risks and issues are um, multiplying. So what what do I think should happen is one resources number one, but resources isn't the end of the story. Um, you know, there's lots of different resources. They are limited, um, but a lot of communities after disaster ha have limited capacity to apply for money, to process um, recovery grants, to think about um, how we should recover, right? And so I really think we need to get into a space of pre-disaster planning and risk mitigation outside of this, oh, it's it's June 1, it's hurricane season. We should be thinking about these issues all of the time. Um, and states need to support these networks of organizations who have and have been working in community for a long time um, and have trust of community members. So that those are some things that I've uh, kind of been wrestling with. Yeah, and I think to Betsy, one of the very first points you made, you know, this challenge of convincing people the value of preparedness is so mm -hmm. important. And, and now is the time to reinforce how much, how much is missing from our preparedness activities, how much we gain, but how far we have to go. Mm -hmm. You know, preparedness is really a challenging tool because it's like when you do it right, it looks like you haven't done anything. And when you do mm -hmm wrong it looks like you haven't done anything but there's a big gap between those haven't done anything right so um it's it's hard to remind people when budgets are being slashed and money's being you know going out the door to all these other things the preparedness is still absolutely essential and the preparedness money has to be spent on preparedness and not because some new priority some new reactive response is is up you know, for bat and needs if resources. There's a, if there's a silver lining to this particular part of the conversation, I think it comes from uh, a lot of times folks will say, well, that happened to you, but it didn't happen to me. And so it doesn't get the same attention, but COVID is happening to everybody. 
So in terms of a personal recent experience with serious consequences, I don't think um, you can hide behind uh, why preparation is so important at this point. Great. Well, again, thank you all for your for your insights. Um, you know, there's I know there's so many more things that you know we could be talking about, but limited time. Um, so just for the last few minutes here, um, as we as we get ready to end, um, if you all just want to spend a few minutes, just if there's anything else you wanted to mention that we haven't talked about yet, or any other closing thoughts you want to leave the audience with, things, next steps, things that are encouraging, worrying, whatever you want to mention. Um, as kind of in closing, we'll go in the opposite direction as we started. So we'll start with Mark okay. and Betsy. And um, I don't want to be flip about this, but in our business, we have a saying, uh, never let a good disaster go to waste. And, 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 and I take that uh, literally, I mean, a lot of people look at risk as, as um, uh, you know, dread, and it is a dreadful thing, but it's also an opportunity. It's an inflection point. It's a time where if we can really, we have a better chance to actually invest in change and get people to actually uh, support that. So part of what I'm thinking about here is based on the conversations we've had today is um, these needs and challenges we've identified. Um, we have, a, we, we have a, a responsibility, I think, to try to figure out uh, where is that low hanging fruit? How can we cobble together uh, uh, a way of, of, of changing the, the way people are, uh, their culture of thinking about this stuff, the way resources are prioritized. Uh, so it, I, I think we want to grab the bull by the horns when we do this. The other thing that I would like to, to express is that I don't view this as, a, as a, a, a sort of a singular solution. I think it requires a bottom up and a top down approach simultaneously. There's no question that the in, at the, the local level is 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 where we have to um, be most concerned, but it's also where we have the most trustworthy people, the folks that have the best knowledge about how the community functions and how and how it needs to be satisfied under these conditions. But at the same time, at the state, regional, federal level, they can marshal resources and and uh, uh, legislation and and, uh, and, and, and edicts, if you want to call it that, uh, to, to be able to provide the type of organizational structure and support that a local community could, could never manifest for themselves. And so we, we have to take both approaches and, and get all those stakeholders at the table so they can understand uh, their roles and their perceptions and, and how they can collaborate to, for the greater good. Yes, and I, I very much agree with that. I think, right, it needs to be a, a combination of local level, state, and federal action, um, empowering local, giving local voice, but resources, you know, needs to come, need to come from state, federal, and, and uh, other organizations to support the needs. Um, some of the main things that, that, you know, in terms of if I were speaking to the public, I, I would obviously, you know, encourage people to do what they can and um, that was brought up earlier in terms of so physically distancing and including wearing face coverings, et cetera. I would also encourage state governments um, as North Carolina just switched over to mandating um, and setting a norm of wearing face coverings. Um, I think that's become been shown to becoming more and more critical um, as a means to, to bring down the, the cases. Um, and then just thinking about pre-disaster planning, and that's pre-disaster planning at the household level, neighborhood, community, your, um, where you work, if you're in school, your school, um, state, federal level. We really need to think about, and it's not, you know, it's not too late. We, everyone should be thinking about, okay, what do we need to prepare in the world we are now and and where what should we be thinking about and there's um and so i would encourage folks to do that as well um and then really outside of the disaster kind of framing or cycle or i guess the recovery part is really thinking societally about addressing some addressing some of the underlying um structural issues that make COVID and hurricanes and whatever disasters come even worse and that magnify those risks. And whether that's issues of healthcare, access to job, education, environmental hazards, all of those um, 
So it, it's a huge ask, obviously, but, but I think we really need to, to think more broadly about disasters. Yeah, I agree completely. And I think we also, um, in order to do any of the things that were just talked about effectively, we have to work really hard to rebuild um, the public's trust in the public health messengers. And um, and it can't wait. Um, you know, it it has to happen now. It has. We have to. We have to rebuild that conversation, and we have to rebuild the um, norm that it is okay to change your mind to get new information um, that the message may change but the message may change doesn't mean the message that you heard before was wrong it means it was right for the time or it was the best we could do then and that we're adapting with this new information to keep people informed and um, make best practices for what with what we have and this is all new territory right so it's it it's based, all of our activities are based on what we know to be true about good public health practice, infectious disease management, infection prevention control, hurricane preparedness and response, general natural disasters and all hazards approach to response. And it's going to change at any given moment based on the current context and, and the, the cultural appropriateness of the response and the needs of the community. And so we have to be good stewards of that message that we're doing the best we can. We may get it wrong. We may try to um, adapt the message so it's more appropriate and more well informed based on the information that we've gathered since the last message. But that doesn't mean you can't trust us. And I think we all have an obligation to um, make sure our communities buy into that approach that that we're all in this together. We're all making the best decisions we can with the information that we have, and we're going to move forward and out of this as safely as possible. Excellent. Well, again, we're just about out of time here, so um, it's amazing how quickly an hour can go. Um, but I want to thank all our panelists again, Dr. Apkowitz, Dr. Albright, Professor Sauer. Um, I, I definitely learned a lot. I hope this was informative. Um, again, I encourage everyone to visit the Duke Science and Society website for uh, more information about our upcoming coronavirus conversation events. Again, our next one will be next Thursday. Um, in a little more than a week from now at 2.30 p.m. looking at return to work. Um, and again, to visit SciPol.org for the policy brief that Science and Society has just published on this event. Um, and, you know, hopefully we will be relatively lucky this year and we won't have a major hurricane hit the U.S. Um, but, you know, maybe if that does happen, we might consider reconvening this panel again to see how we've been doing and what we've been learning um, if and when that does happen. So again, thank you very much to all the panelists. Um, thank you to all the our audience members and all the questions. and of course, a pause. Um, and we, I hope that you all have a good rest of your day and a happy holiday weekend. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks.